You want to buy a mic. Well, before you spend that cash on one, make sure you know what you're buying. Shopping for mics is a real pain if you don't know what you're looking at. It's hard to compare if you can't hear that $39 mic versus that $700 mic. So how do you know? You understand the four main characteristics every mic has, and to sing that tune, you need to know the words. A transducer is a device that converts variations in sound into an electrical signal. Sound is just vibration, and these come from your voice or a musical instrument. These sound vibrations go into the mic, get turned into electrical stuff called signals, and are sent down the cable to the speaker or recorder. These signals, when played back, are changed into sound, and you can hear it. So when you see the word transducer type, all it's talking is what method of mic you're using to capture the sound. That gives you two flavors of mics. Condenser mics. A condenser mic is like the one I'm using now. It has a diaphragm and behind that, an electrically charged plate. Sound gets that diaphragm moving, vibrating, and creates changes in the electrical field of the plate, and that's what creates the audio signal. Since these mics are electric, they need to be powered by either a battery in the mic or some other power source. It's not like you connect up the cable to the mic, run it to the recorder, and then connect another power source to the mic to power it. On these condenser mics, the audio recorder, mixer, or camera sends power up the same wires that the audio was traveling down on. Since the power source is not obvious or seen, like a ghost, it's referred to as phantom power. Most condenser mics need some sort of phantom power, which is why they hook up to an XLR cable, which can handle that. Dynamic mics. The other type of mic is a dynamic mic, like the one I am using now, which has a much simpler design. Because of that, they can withstand a lot more of abuse. Dynamic mics have a diaphragm, a voice coil, a magnet, and don't need to be powered since the magnet and coil create the electrical signal through the magic of physics. Sound hits the diaphragm, the diaphragm vibrates, the voice coil moves, and that makes the magnet create energy, the audio signals. Since these are not powered, they are often referred to as passive mics. Not being powered, they don't put out a lot of signals, so they are usually held close to the source, like your mouth. The other two types of transducers are ribbon and electric, but frankly, 99% of the people watching this channel will be looking at a condenser or a dynamic mic. Which is better? Condenser mics sound more natural because the diaphragm responds to sound changes faster. That also makes them more sensitive so they reproduce sound better. Condenser mics can't take the abuse that these dynamic mics can and are usually more expensive in comparison. That's not to say dynamic mics sound bad. The point being, these mics are different and it depends on what you want to do with them. Polar patterns. You've probably seen these graphics of microphone polar patterns. If you don't know what you're looking at, you're missing out on how the mic works and maybe why you purchased the mic and struggled with it. When you hear or see polar pattern, think direction and you'll get it. Polar pattern, direction. Omnidirectional mics. Omni is a word which means in all ways or all places. When you hear that a mic is omnidirectional, the mic picks up sound from all directions. For most video creators watching this channel, you're going to be looking at a lav mic like this one, which is omnidirectional. I can move my head back and forth, and it still picks up the sound. I can turn the mic to the left, to the right, and even upside down, and it still picks up the sound. When you're talking about an omni or all directional mic, you don't have to aim it. You wouldn't use one of these for a stage performance. You'd pick up everything, the other mics, the stage monitors, the audience. For that, you'd want a directional mic. Directional mics. A directional mic has a polar pattern that accepts sound from the front and tries to reject sound from the rear. A directional mic has a polar pattern that accepts sound from the front and tries to reject sound from the rear. You'll also hear these called unidirectional mics, uni being one. These directional mics attempt to isolate the source of the sound. For most video creators watching this channel, you're going to be looking at a shotgun mic, which are directional. Here's the most common you'll run into. Cardioid is a math word which graphically represents a heart in a circle. That's why these mics are called cardioid mics, as the polar pattern looks like an upside-down heart. 
These are commonly used as vocal or speech microphones since they are good at rejecting sounds from other directions. That's all you're looking at here on this chart, a graphical representation of how much sound will be picked up from the mic. Omnidirectional, cardioid, or directional. Supercardioid mics. A supercardioid is a directional mic that has a narrower pickup pattern from the front. Interestingly enough, it also picks up a little sound from the rear. That's not a bad thing. Cardioid, supercardioid. Hypercardioid mics. A hypercardioid is a directional mic touted as being better in rooms with a lot of echo than a supercardioid. I can't say that I've been able to hear the difference, but that doesn't mean you won't. However, these hypercardioid mics tend to cut off the lows, and personally, I don't like them with my voice. Also, they have a very narrow pickup pattern, so you better be sure you got the mic pointed directly at the sound source. But if you're going to drop some dough on a new mic for your videos, consider looking at hypercardioid mics. Other mics. As mentioned, there are other types of mics, a bit more specialized, and I think most watching this channel wouldn't normally use them. For example, bi-directional mics will pick up sound from the front and the back and reject sound from the sides. You might use this type of mic when you're doing interviews with two people across from each other in a studio setting. Still with me? These will all tie together in a minute, so hang in there and you won't be fooled ever again when looking at mics. Frequency response. Frequency describes the number of waves in a given amount of time. This is measured in hertz, abbreviated HZ. It's a number of waves that occur in one second. The human ear is said to hear around 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. When you see 20 khz, that means kilohertz, a kilo being a thousand, so 20,000 hertz and 20 kilohertz are the same thing. Frequency mostly refers to pitch, and you'll see why this important factor applies to mics in a moment. If you play a note on a musical instrument, it vibrates at a specific frequency. How would a bass guitar and another guitar make sure they're in tune with each other? Since the musical note A is a frequency of 440 hertz, that's 440 vibrations per second, they can all tune their instruments to the same frequency. Check this out. A typical human male voice is around 85 to 180 hertz, and a typical female, 165 to 255 hertz. If you're trying to pull the voice up out of a mix so people can hear it better, you know what range to look in. You can also knock down the music track in that range, and the voice will cut through the music track so it can be heard better. I'm sure you've seen these movies where you can't make out what was being said over the soundtrack, and that's how you would fix it. Now back to mics. If you look at the frequency response specs of a mic, it only tells you a range like 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. That's okay, as you can tell the range, the mic can capture sound. What you want to look at is the response curve, which tells you how well the mic captures sound at those various frequencies, and that's where those charts you see really tell the tale. The horizontal numbers are the frequencies, the pitch, and the vertical numbers represent output level, loudness, and they call it decibels, or dB. As you look at a frequency chart, you can see how a given microphone will perform. For example, here's a chart of my favorite mic of all time, the Rode NTG3. It's a supercardioid mic and is very flat, meaning it picks up the sound source as natural as possible. That makes it possible to post-process the sound of my liking in an audio editor, although I found it leads little or none. I use this mic almost exclusively for my videos, as with my voice, it needs very little post-processing and makes my voice sound good. Here's a dynamic mic that's been around forever, the Shure SM58. Quite different. The mic's frequencies have been tailored to make instruments and singing vocals sound great. Confused? Don't be. We'll cover the last thing to look for in a mic, then I'll show you how easy it is to compare mics and know what you're spending your money on. Impedance. There's another thing most people don't consider overlook or don't understand mic impedance rating. Impedance is an electronic term, you know, impede, prevent or stop something. Impedance basically says how much the mic will tell the audio coming in to bugger off. All mics have an impedance rating on the mic, on the website, or in the manual. You'll see a number in a little symbol like this, 6,000, and that's ohms. This little symbol is ohms and we don't care. Throw all the electronic crap aside and here's what you need to know. Low impedance is better than high impedance. The general rule is low impedance, less than 6,000 ohms is good. Medium impedance, 6,000 to 10,000, not as good. 
High impedance, greater than 10,000, sucks. That's not definitive, and opinions on a scale vary widely. Regardless, high impedance mics are usually cheap as hell. They don't work well over long distance cable and lose high frequencies. Not always true, but you can usually tell a mic's quality by its impedance rating. Low impedance mics are preferred, and guess what? If your mixer or recorder has crap impedance, then your sound will be, well, crap. Look at this deal shotgun mic, the Tackstar SGC598, $32, which has an output impedance of 2,000 ohms. That's good, it's in our low impedance range, right? No. Compare my Rode NTG3 shotgun, which has an output impedance of 25 ohms. Okay, so which mic do you buy? There's the million dollar question, and here's some million dollar answers. How to compare mics. Now that you're armed with info, you won't be fooled anymore by those fooligans trying to sell you some cheap ass mic. You'll be able to look at the specs and charts, compare different mics, and get the best one for your budget. Let's say you're narrowed down the type of mic you want, like a super cardioid shotgun mic. Now you're looking at 10 different mics between 100 and 200 bucks that you like. First, look at the polar pattern. Make sure it has a super cardioid pattern. Not everyone selling these things know the things that they are selling. There goes four mics out of the picture. Second, look at the frequency response. Is it in a good range like 40 hertz to 20 kilohertz? There goes another two mics out. Look at the frequency graph. Is it flat? Have they modified the mic to add or subtract frequencies that you'll have to deal with after recording? There's another two out. Now we got two left. Compare the impedance. 20 ohms versus 1,000? You've got your mic. Mystery solved, and you just saved a lot of time, money, and headaches. Test and watch. I went to my friend, fellow YouTuber, Curtis Judd. The guy knows sound, and if you're interested in sound and you're not subscribed to his channel, you're really missing out. I asked him about how he would choose a mic, and he said this. I listen to as many sound samples as possible from the mic I'm considering. I want to hear how it responds to different voices and with different recorders. I also want a sampling of different types of locations, and I keep in mind the skill levels of those that recorded the sample audio. I also keep in mind that some people know how to process their audio, so you may not be getting a good sense for how the mic sounds before processing. That's why I try to listen to as many samples beforehand as possible. I buy from places where I can return the mic if it is horrible, but this is tricky. Many places won't take microphones back because people essentially spray them with all sorts of saliva during use, and they consider this a sanitary issue. I find my favorite reviewers on YouTube and whatever else I can find and see what they have to say about a particular mic, like you or Caleb. Short answer, I try to listen to at least a couple of sample recordings from a mic before I put my hard-earned cash down on it. Thanks, Curtis. If you're interested, check out the audio courses offered by Curtis over at Learn Light and Sound, the link in the description below. Who to buy from? There are a lot of mic manufacturers out there that are reputable. Sure, as an Aperture, Actually, Aperture's mic division has been spun off to Deity Microphones, Ceremonic, Rode, AKG, Audio Technica, Behringer, Electrovoice, Shopes, Sennheiser, just to name a few. They support their customers, have been around for years, and more importantly, they manufacture the mics. There are a lot of fly-by-night outfits out there in the business of throwing together some parts to sell you on saving money for your cheapo mics, and in the end, you won't be happy and will spend more on mic after mic than if you just did your research up front and spent that money on a quality mic that will last you for years to come. Most importantly, your videos and films will sound good, and isn't that really what it's all about? I've listed a few mics I have personally used and recommend in the description below this video. And hey, if you haven't checked out Basic Filmmaker University recently, you may want to head over there. There's some exciting stuff happening right now and in the next couple of weeks, which I'll fill you in on later. I hope that helps. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Like this Sure SM.
Impudence. <laughs> no, it's impedance.